Okay, well the rubbers are just about ready to start putting up concrete tiles. And we'll show you that process once they start. So inside, we've moved ahead on the framing and mechanical systems. We also collected a few more field stones here for the fireplace and living room. And we framed up the wall over here in the kitchen. We also framed up the walls in the master bath. Now in here, there's something a little different. We built this wall out of two by eights. It doubles its width and gives a little bit more room to accommodate the heating runs, the water pipes, and the drain pipes that run from the basement up to accommodate the second floor. Now this isn't a load-bearing wall. So we're able to take some pretty good-sized cuts out of it. And for log settling, we created a slip joint pretty much the same as on the wall in the kitchen. And what's kind of interesting is the plumber here has created his own slip joint. He has pipes connected like so. So as the logs settle, they settle right down to their joint. Upstairs, he used the floor system to hide all the plumbing and heating runs. First he put down the ducts and pipes, then we came back and installed the two by four sleepers. This brings the finished floor up to a height that will cover all this. Now this is the area right here for the upstairs bath. This will be the toilet, the tub will go right over here, and that will be the vanity. Now the three silver lines you see right here are the hot air supplies to the bedroom. And this chase right here, formed with two by fours, is actually the cold air return. Now we have a couple of runs sneaking around in this direction, one servicing the back bedroom, the other one the middle bedroom, and then the third run is for the front bedroom. And notice none of them cross over the cavity here that we built for the cold air return. Now the electrician is also taking advantage of being able to run all of his wires. And now that the exterior chinking's been applied, he's run some of his wires in between the logs. This will form a receptacle right here. And later on, the interior chinking will cover up the exposed wires. That should give you a pretty good idea of how we work with built-up flooring to hide mechanical systems. Now, the next thing we want to do is lay down plywood to cover all this up. And I'll help Dr. do all of that. We put the sleepers down over a layer of builder's belt, which will limit the creaking between the 2x4s and the subfloor. The sleepers function sort of like floor joists, giving us nailing surfaces for securing the plywood. We secured them 16 inches on center, except where the ducts forced us to offset them. We ran them along the logs at the perimeter of the floor so we could nail down the outside edges of the plywood. And to make a tight seal between the plywood and the sleepers, we're putting down a bead of construction adhesive along each 2x4. We got all the plywood flooring down. Doctor's notching out some logs now for another partition wall. And the rivers are starting to put up the concrete tiles. Let's check that out. Well, this is a tile we've selected. It's actually a concrete tile designed to look like slate. It has lugs at the top to catch onto the furring strips and a hole here to nail into the furring strip. Now basically it gets installed like shingles. You begin with a starter course and just work your way up the roof. There's grooves on one side that interlock with the next shingle as roofers move to the left-hand side. And for the rake, there's a 90-degree tile like so that goes over the edge and just gets nailed right to the face, as you can see right down here. Concrete isn't typically used to cover roofs here in the upper Midwest because of the problems sometimes caused by the frequent cycles of freezing and thawing in the spring and autumn. But these tiles have a very low rate of moisture absorption, which means water won't soak in, freeze, and crack the tiles during freeze and thaw cycles. So they come with a 50-year warranty. On our roof, one of the main challenges is keeping the moisture from leaking into the valleys between the gable dormer roofs and the main roof. They've used 16 ounce copper flashing to protect each valley from moisture. They cut the tiles with a diamond tip blade to match the angle of the valley. And they nail them in flush with a groove in the center of the valley flashing. The tiles come in five different shades of green, terracotta, gray, and brown. But each contains traces of colors of the other. And this is through a unique manufacturing process where the concrete is colored as the tiles are made at the factory. Then the roofers spread them out in random patterns, and this keeps it looking like a slate roof. Our masons, Tim Tusek and Mike Jamison, have been moving right along here on the fireplace. 
They built a plastic tent around the scaffold in case we get a cold snap. It'll keep the materials dry so they can keep on working. Why don't we take a peek inside? Well, it is relatively cozy in here. Now, one thing they have to take into consideration when building a fireplace is the fact that the logs will be settling around the mortar. So basically what they have to do is build a fireplace that's completely freestanding. I'll show you what I mean. Progress. They had to keep the field store and masonry separated from the logs, so they built in a two and a half inch gap between the two and stuffed it with insulation. This way, as the log wall settles, the logs can move down along the fireplace and they won't get bound up on anything. Another thing to take into consideration with settling logs is the roof flashing here. The roof is laid down first a piece of copper flashing that comes up underneath here like so. We took a second piece and cut that in directly to the logs. This way, as the log settles, the top piece comes over the top of the first. Works out great because the two operate as separate independent units. stud walls here on the second floor to form three bedrooms and a hallway here coming through our opening. Now what we're doing is cutting out notches here in the log walls wherever a partition intersects one of those log walls, basically the same way we did downstairs, except up here we aren't notching out quite as deep for the stud, but we are making a fairly deep groove here for the three-quarter inch paneling that goes on either side of the partition. So all we have to do now is stick in our slotted studs here on either end. We're raising up our first stud wall here underneath this purlin, which should be a pretty good surface to nail everything to. Now, the overall height here is about 11 feet between the floor and the purlin, but we're going to start off here with a standard 8 foot wall and then work our way up from there. Get this up over the top here. All right, now we're all set to extend our wall up to the purlin up here with this piece of framing. I notice we cut these cripples just a little bit short. That's to create our slip joint. What I want to do now is trim this up. Okay, I got this. Get this other side of the shim in here. Okay, now you notice that we're leaving our gap here. That's so we can nail this piece of framing directly to the purlin. All right, so the gap here forms our slip joint. Once these two areas are paneled, we'll nail on another piece of trim to this member right here. And as the logs settle, that piece of trim will come right down over our bottom section. So the next thing we want to do is line bolt up to these members to keep the wall in line, and then we'll move on and notch off to the next partition. Meanwhile, the roofers are making progress on the concrete tiles, but it is taking a while. The tiles are pretty heavy. So part of the job involves elevating them. They've got a nice setup here, though, with a ladder and a power hoist. After laying out enough piles over the back porch, they start laying that part of the roof. 